The other day I watched the recent interview on Joe Rogan's podcast with John Reeves, the owner of the land that he's named the Boneyard Alaska, where thousands of fossils from Ice Age fauna have been found in just five acres. Although it has been barely investigated by paleontologists, some initial insights from the Boneyard show that this site is incredibly important to our understanding of the ancient past, not least whether a catastrophe or a series of catastrophes may have occurred at the onset of the Younger Dryas period due to the impact of a comet. The podcast got me thinking about a previous video I did on Malta's Ice Age bone caves. So in this episode, I discuss what we can learn from boneyards and bone caves dating to the Pleistocene. So let's start with this amazing site in Alaska. John Reeves, the gentleman who owns it, is a gold miner and has a very interesting biography. Although I watched the interview on Joe Rogan because I wanted to find out more about the bones, I really enjoyed listening to John's life story so far as well. What's fascinating about this site is the sheer volume of bones densely packed into a small area and dating back to the Ice Age. Only a small number of samples have been radiocarbon dated, which John ordered and paid for himself. And these dates, together with the species that have been found, such as mammoths, prove that we are looking at an Ice Age site. John has done a lot of work on the history of his land, looking back at previous mentions of the bones in letters and photographs in his company archives. He's discovered that the existence of Ice Age bones there has been known about for a long time, but very little has been done in the way of proper paleontological research. It also seems that quite a lot of bones have gone missing over the years. So when John realized what an interesting site he had bought, he and his family started digging up and collecting the bones. So far, they've discovered thousands of them and have now built a facility in which to preserve them. They've even found the fossilized remains of what's thought to be a saber-toothed tiger. This is the furthest north that one has been found in the Americas so far. Let's talk about catastrophism for a second and how relevant this site might be to that particular discussion. From a geological perspective, the last 2.5 million years are classed as the Quaternary Era. This is divided into two epochs, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. We are currently in the Holocene, which began at the end of the Younger Dryas period, around 11,700 years ago. After the last glacial maximum of the most recent ice age ended, the Earth started warming and the ice sheets started retreating. This period of warming, which lasted almost 2,000 years, is known as the last glacial interstadial. It was interrupted by the onset of a strange epoch of cooling, which has been named the Younger Dryas period, and which lasted around 800 years before warmer conditions returned. It's named after a type of vegetation that's usually found in glacial conditions, but started cropping up at that time in areas that had previously been too warm for it. There's been a lot of debate as to what caused and ended the Younger Dryas period, with quite a number of scientists and alternative researchers attributing its onset to an impact by a comet. This is known as the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis and implies that a series of sudden catastrophic events were unleashed by the impact and that these may have been memorialized in oral traditions all over the world. I followed Randall Carlson's work for years and it's pretty mind-blowing. There is evidence for the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. I won't go into detail about that because that isn't what this video is about. However, one important piece of evidence which is relevant to this episode is the mass extinction of Ice Age fauna. However, most experts don't talk about one particular extinction event. They talk about numerous extinctions which have taken place during the Quaternary period from 130,000 years ago onwards, but they do emphasize that the majority of the fauna disappeared around the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, which encompasses the Younger Dryas period. Paleontologists think this was due to overhunting by humans as we spread across the planet, as well as a natural resort of the climatic changes that took place then. But some scientists, as well as alternative researchers, think that whatever initiated the Younger Dryas period also caused the obliteration of Ice Age species of fauna and flora. 
Now back to the Boneyard, Alaska. John mentions in the interview that he found burnt rock underneath some of the bones. Vitrified rock is associated with intense heat. If you saw my video on the vitrified hill forts of Scotland, I'll put a link below if you didn't, you will know that it's very difficult to manually create the sort of temperatures needed to cause vitrefaction. So the question is, could the Boneyard Alaska be proof that a comet hit as championed by the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, or perhaps it is evidence for Dr. Robert Schock's hypothesis that a solar-induced plasma event occurred at that time. Aside from the burnt rock, it's quite hard to explain why there are so many Ice Age mammals in such a small area. If they did die due to hunting and the climate, then some sort of fast-moving water must have washed them into this site. They didn't die there. But by and large, the sea level rise that took place at the end of the Ice Age is considered to have been gradual, relatively gradual. The meltwater pulses, which were more rapid periods of eustatic sea level change, did have super floods associated with them, such as in the Mississippi Valley. But overall, a giant flood similar to the myths is not thought to have took place. If we move on to Malta, there are quite a few caves and fissures on the islands where quaternary fossilized deposits have been found. In the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a lot of speculation that such deposits occurred because of the giant and very famous biblical flood. One scholar wrote that crushed hippo bones in the Ardalum cave were a result of high pressure water flows. But as more detailed research continued throughout the 20th century, this idea soon fell out of favour. The bones must have got into the fissures and caves somehow, but this is probably due to the actions of streams and rivers. One of the things that first astonished me when I came to Malta was the number of huge dry valleys that traverse the islands. There are no perennial streams or rivers here. These enormous valleys were created through a combination of tectonic activity and pluvial action, the latter because the climate was a lot wetter during the last ice age. At that time, Malta was a lot larger, and a land bridge joined it to Sicily. It's thought that much of the fauna arrived in Malta from Sicily due to several migrations. This is Malta, Gozo, and Sicily now, with sea levels being around 120 metres higher than during the last glacial maximum. And this is how the area looked back then. It's amazing to think that around 180,000 years ago, water-loving hippopotami roamed around the islands. Modern-day conditions certainly would not be appropriate for them. Deposits of hippopotami have often been found associated with rounded pebbles, which implies they were carried there by water, and that makes sense. The islands were full of watercourses at that point, and during the winter, presumably, they would have flooded due to torrential rain. However, if a giant superflood or tsunami had occurred, then it's likely that these deposits would also contain marine mollusks. In general, quaternary deposits have not been found to contain marine mollusks. Those that did contain them had evidence for human activity, so were essentially disturbed layers. Let's take a quick look at the faunal assemblages that existed in Malta during the Pleistocene. One of the most famous sites in Malta is the Ardalum Cave. Ar means cave in Maltese, so I'm actually saying cave, dalum, cave. But anyway. It has a very clear stratigraphic record with six different layers and was formed due to the action of a river that once ran through the area. The first layer is bone free, but the second layer dates to between 180,000 and 130,000 years ago and mostly contained hippopotamus bones when it was excavated. By the way, no mammoths made it down to Malta in case you were wondering. The third layer is just pebbles, and the fourth, much more recent layer contained the remains of deer, wolves, bears, and foxes, and dates back to between 18,000 and 10,000 years. The fifth calcareous layer is made up of volcanic ash. Malta is not volcanic like its neighboring islands of Sicily, Pantelleria, Linosa, and Lampedusa. So any volcanic ash must have come from a pretty sizable eruption event overseas. The sixth layer at Ardalum is the cultural layer, which has human, animal, and pottery remains dating back to the early Neolithic, where Malta was first settled. Apart from Ardalum, there are quite a few other sites, many of which are now part of urban areas, which makes it even more fascinating to picture how the landscape has changed. Hippopotamus bones have been excavated from 
Berkakara, Hamrun, Emriel, where the school is, close to the St. Margarita Chapel in Bumarad, and during construction works at the school in Zebush, amongst many others. At the Emriel site, elephant, deer, and bare bones were also found in a layer on top of the one where the hippopotamus remains were discovered, as was a volcanic ash layer. So it had a similar stratigraphy to Ardalum, which presumably indicates that the landscape was quite similar when both deposits ended up there. I imagine an old river must have carried both deposits there, or flooding must have moved the bones from higher ground to lower ground but whichever mechanism it was this must have happened at two different times in prehistory separated by tens of thousands of years. In the Weed Il Hesri, which is the valley between Zabush and Sijui, an excavation of a fissure in the 1800s brought up dwarf elephant remains, swans, large tortoises, and various other fauna. In the 1900s, the same fissure was accidentally accessed again by a farmer, and more bones were excavated. I believe that fissure represents the oldest faunal complex in Malta. There are four or five different faunal complexes, depending on the research. These are the time periods when different types of animals inhabited the islands alongside each other. The migrations from Sicily across the land bridge must have been followed by periods of isolation because there are also examples of insular dwarfism and gigantism, such as small elephants and giant swans. Insular dwarfism is thought to occur because resources are limited, and insular gigantism is thought to occur because large predators are not present. That's to put it simply. I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. There are many more bone caves and references in the literature to smaller deposits. There's no need to go into all of them. I just wanted to give an insight into how different the landscape was back then and why there's been various debates about a catastrophe having occurred during the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, which led to a mass extinction. If we say that overhunting caused fauna in North America to die out, we cannot apply the same reason for the extinction of Ice Age mammals in Malta because humans didn't settle on the islands until several thousand years later. For sure, it could have been a natural die out as a result of climatic conditions, which paleontologists also mention for other locations alongside overhunting. However, I guess I find it strange that places at different latitudes with drastically different climates would all have succumbed to the same resource deficit. Then again, as the islands became smaller and more isolated with sea level rise, food would have been pretty scarce, making it difficult for mammals to survive. But I'm more inclined to think that the climatic conditions were tied to a natural disaster, which caused catastrophes that led to the extinction of fauna. It doesn't have to be a comet, it doesn't have to be a big flood, but something, I think something pretty substantial took place. The volcanic ash layer between the last Ice Age fauna and the first evidence of human occupation at Ardalum, which was also found at Umriul, makes me wonder if what we're looking at is an enormous volcano that contributed to the extinction event. But then the ash had to have settled once the fauna had already washed into the cave, so I guess that doesn't really make sense. However, I also wonder if the onset of the Younger Dryas period was caused by a natural disaster, then perhaps the series of catastrophes it initiated were over a really long period of time. Maybe there was a huge amount of tectonic instability over thousands of years, causing earthquakes, volcanoes and tsunamis, all of which had different effects on different geographic locations but ultimately all led to the extinction of Ice Age fauna. Tell me what you think in the comments. It would be great to get the conversation going around this topic because it's one of my favorites and I really wanna like go so much deeper into the research on this. Thank you for watching and supporting my channel via Super Chats, memberships, and Patreon. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and tell your prehistory loving friends about it. I'll see you next time.